Hello, this is Jeannie Poole. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Heart Rhythm O2 Journal. This is our podcast for January 2023. We are excited to bring you this group of papers. This is the first year since we started that we are now publishing monthly. The first paper is authored by Dr. Bernstein and colleagues from UC Davis in Sacramento. The title is Incidents and Implications of Atrial Fibrillation in Patients Hospitalized for COVID Compared to Non-COVID Pneumonia, a Multicenter Cohort Study. The purpose of this study was to assess differences in outcome of patients admitted for pneumonia and or ARDS with and without a COVID diagnosis and who develop atrial fibrillation. Of 39,415 patients admitted with pneumonia or ARDS, 12.2% had COVID. The COVID cohort were younger and had more comorbidities than the non-COVID cohort. Although AF incidence was lower than the COVID cohort, 10% versus 14%, in hospital mortality in the COVID cohort compared to the non-COVID cohort was 8% versus 5%. Incident atrial fibrillation was associated with significantly higher in-hospital mortality in both cohorts, with an odds ratio of 5.53 for the COVID group and an odds ratio of 2.75 in the non-COVID group. AF was related to ICU care requiring pressor support and mechanical ventilation. The patients had normal cardiac troponin levels. The authors conclude that incident AF is lower in COVID patients compared to non-COVID patients who have pneumonia or ARDS and seems to be related to the severity of illness rather than cardiac injury. AF was associated with a higher mortality and prolonged hospitalization. The second paper is titled On-Screen Image-Guided Lead Placement in Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy, Feasibility and Outcome in a Multicenter Setting. The authors are Dr. Philippe Wouters and colleagues from the Utrecht, Netherlands. These authors evaluate the use of image guidance to place LV leads in 30 patients from three hospital centers. CMR was performed within three months prior to the procedure to identify areas of scars and areas of late mechanical activation. Segments without scar but clear late mechanical activation were considered optimal for LV lead placement. During the procedure, the LV leads were placed with image overlay guidance and fluoroscopy. Patients were followed up to six months by measuring LV volume. Volumetric response and super response were defined as 15% or 30% reduction, respectively, in the LV and systolic volume. The patient cohort included 59% men, 62% non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and 69% had a left bundle branch block. LV leads were placed as close as possible to the areas of late activation. This resulted in 14 leads placed within the late activation, 62% adjacent and 24% remote from the areas of late activation. 86% of patients had improved left ventricular and systolic volume, with 66% having a 30% reduction. The authors concluded that in several centers, image guidance was feasible and resulted in a high level of CRT response. The authors plan a randomized control trial titled ADVISE, which is an acronym for Advanced Image Supported Lead Placement in Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy. The next paper is Exploratory Use of Intraprocedural Transesophageal Echocardiography to Guide Implantation of the Leadless Pacemaker. The first author is Dr. Bashir Giath. These authors explore the use of transesophageal echocardiography to guide placement of a leadless pacemaker. The authors report on 56 patients where the device was positioned with the use of TEE to a mid-RV septal position. They analyzed both ultrasound and ECG parameters. They measured the distance between the leadless pacemaker and various cardiac landmarks. The authors identified that the transgastric view was the best to visualize the lead placement of the leadless pacemaker. The mean tricuspid valve to leadless pacemaker distance was about 5 centimeters. The mean pulmonary valve to leadless pacemaker distance was about 4 centimeters. The calculated RV apical to leadless pacemaker distance was about 3 centimeters. ECG's post-implant showed a 38% QRS widening compared to baseline. The authors conclude that this proof-of-concept study supports the use of TEE to guide leadless pacemaker placement and can be used to develop a pacing implant protocol using this imaging modality.
The next paper is titled Invasive Electrophysiologic Testing to Predict and Guide Permanent Pacemaker Implantation After Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation, a Meta-Analysis. This is by Dr. Konstantinos Santis. These authors performed a meta-analysis of 18 studies which report on the use of EP studies to help risk stratify patients post-TAVI who need a permanent pacemaker. This included a total of 1,230 patients. Seven of the studies reported on only post-TAVI EP and the remaining 11 included EP studies before and after the TAVI. Of the 1,230 patients, 16% had a permanent pacemaker implanted. The authors found that the pre-TAVI compared to post-TAVI patients and those who had both pre- and post-EP studies performed had significant changes on the AH and HV intervals. The mean AH interval pre-TAVI was 104 milliseconds and post-TAVI was 119 milliseconds. The pre-TAVI HV interval was 52 milliseconds and the post-TAVI HV interval was 63 milliseconds. Their analysis identified that a pre-TAVI HV interval greater than 70 milliseconds and the absolute post-TAVI HV interval were most closely related to high-grade AV block and permanent pacemaker implantation with an odds ratio of 2.53 and 1.01 per 1 millisecond increase, respectively. In 10 of the studies, the authors identified patients in whom a permanent pacemaker was implanted whose indications were considered equivocal. These were a new left bundle branch block or transient high-grade AV block. Interestingly, long-term, 57% of these patients demonstrated pacemaker dependency. The authors conclude that EP studies may be useful to risk stratify post-TAVI high-grade AV block and that it may be particularly helpful in patients with a left bundle branch block or transient high-grade AV block. In the next paper, Dr. Julia Isbister and colleagues from Australia report their findings from their paper titled Longitudinal Assessment of Structural Phenotype in Brugada Syndrome Using Cardiac Magnetic Resonance Imaging. In their study, the authors used serial CMR imaging to look at progressive structural changes in a group of 18 patients with a diagnosis of Brugada Syndrome. All patients met the definitions stated in International Guidelines documents. 72% of the 18 patients were men with a mean age of 47 years. The average time between CMRs was five years. The authors found that none of the patients had late gadolinium enhancement or LGE on their baseline CMRs, but four or 22% had developed LGE on their follow-up CMRs. The LGE was mostly located at the RV side of the basal septum. Over time, RV and systolic volume increased and right ventricular ejection fraction dropped slightly. In four patients, the right ventricular ejection fraction dropped by 10%. It was observed that there was no diffuse LGE in this patient group by parametric mapping. The authors conclude that these findings advance our understanding regarding the pathological substrate of Brugada syndrome. The next paper's title is Safe and Effective Delivery of High-Power Short-Duration Radiofrequency Ablation Lesions with a Flexible Tip Ablation Catheter by Dr. Leon Zhajek and colleagues. This is an experimental canine model studying high-power short-duration radiofrequency ablation on the outcome of ablation times. The authors note that high-power short-duration has not had widespread adoption over concerns that thermocouples may underestimate tissue temperature. In this study, the authors compare the safety and efficacy of high-power short-duration and low-power long-duration RFA for pulmonary vein isolation in 12 canines. The authors use the Abbott Tactiflex TM sensor-enabled TM catheter. The two approaches were first, high-power short-duration RFA with 50 watts for 10 seconds, and second, low power, long duration RFA with 30 watts for a maximum of 60 seconds. Pulmonary vein isolation was assessed at 30 minutes post ablation and then again at about 28 days. The authors used CT scans to assess for pulmonary vein stenosis. After the final follow-up, the animals were sacrificed and ablation lesions were examined with, with histopathology. The authors performed a total of 545 ablation lesions of which 252 were performed with LPLD and the remainder with HPSD.
No steam pops occurred in the LPLD and two occurred in the HPSD. Ablation times were cut threefold with the HPSD. All pulmonary veins remained isolated at the 30 minute assessment. At the 28 day follow up, 12 of the 12 LPLD canine PVIs remained isolated. For the HPSD, 11 of the 12 canines had complete PVI isolation. The histology showed transmural lesions for all the ablations and no pulmonary vein stenoses were observed in this study. The authors conclude that the investigational catheter using high power short duration resulted in effective RFA lesions and that the ablation times were cut by threefold compared to low power long duration RFA. The title of the next paper is an Ensemble of Features-Based Deep Learning Neural Network for Reduction of Inappropriate Atrial Fibrillation Detection in Implantable Cardiac Monitors by Dr. Shantanu Sarkar. This study explores the use of an application-specific convolutional neural network, or CNN, to reduce inappropriate AF detection in implantable cardiac monitors, or ICMs. The process uses a customized Ensemble of features that were developed using AF episodes from implanted cardiac monitors and then validated on an independent patient cohort with ICMs. In total, the training validation sets came from 2,516 patients with 31,757 AF episodes and 28,506 false episodes. The validation set was a 20% random set of both true and false AF. The authors report an AUC of 0.996. The performance of the app-specific CNN in an independent test set had an AUC of 0.993 and sensitivity of 98% with specificity of 91.4%. The authors conclude that an ensemble of features-based CNNs reduced inappropriate AF detection in ICMs by over 90% while preserving sensitivity. The next paper is a review paper titled Evolution of Extravascular Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillator Therapy for Ventricular Arrhythmias by Hans Reimers and colleagues. In this review, the authors discuss the development of the Boston Scientific Subcutaneous ICD and the Medtronic EV ICD. They also review the risks, the potential implant complications, and benefits of extravascular ICDs. In the next brief report paper by Dr. Eric Prostowski entitled Management of Inappropriate Sinus Tachycardia During Pregnancy, he describes the experience of 11 consecutive patients with inappropriate sinus tachycardia during pregnancy. Discussed also are their symptoms and evaluation and in particular response to beta blocker therapy. This report is the largest consecutive series of patients developing inappropriate sinus tachycardia during pregnancy. The next paper is our Fellows Corner paper. The title is Diagnostic Decapolar Catheter Entrapment in the Coronary Sinus, a Rare Complication of Electrophysiology Procedures. The first author is Dr. Samuel Tu. We encourage you all to read our Fellows Corner case reports and encourage any fellows that you are working with to submit reports to HRO2. The final paper is our featured paper for our Global Voices section of the journal for January. This paper's title is Electrophysiology Practice in Low- and Middle-Income Countries, an Updated Review on Access to Care and Health Delivery by Dr. Kershid and colleagues. In this review, the authors describe in depth the changes to practicing electrophysiology in low- and middle-income countries. Well, this finishes our podcast for January. It's been a pleasure to review these papers for you, and I hope you'll listen next month when we review our February issue. Thank you so much for listening, and have a wonderful day.